Well, I think from time to time, it is a really good practice to reinvestigate, rediscover the person of Jesus. Uh, The longer that sometimes you sit in seats in church, uh, the longer that you're just around Christianity, uh, it's really easy for us to become unfamiliar with Jesus because we think we understand everything about him. But one thing that we're doing this month is we're rediscovering, reinvestigating an angle of this beautiful diamond that is Jesus. Uh, And we're looking specifically at the humanity of Jesus. We talked last week that um, uh, most people uh, in the Western world that we find ourselves living in, uh, there's a lot of people that are really comfortable with the humanity of Jesus being like, well, he's just a human, a great teacher, a great example, but it sort of stops right there. There's a lot of people that are comfortable with that. Then there's a lot of people like you and I, people that would come to churches on Sunday mornings and uh, that would be more comfortable with just the divinity of Jesus, sort of thinking, well, he's kind of a superhero, kind of superhuman. He doesn't really understand uh, my life, and we just worship him, but uh, the humanity side's a little tricky for us. And we talked last week about this beautiful reality, this Christian doctrine that says that both sides are falling short, and it's this doctrine called the hypostatic union. You have to get hyped for that. Yeah, get hyped for that theology, right? But the hypostatic union is so beautiful and so powerful because it teaches us that Jesus is 100% God. He never wasn't God. He's always been God. He's 100% divine God, but he's also at the exact same time 100% human. He's both at the same time, not 50-50, not 75-25. No, he's 100% God, 100% human. I love what Frederick Beekner says about the scandal and the mystery of the hypostatic union. He says this, the incarnation or Jesus becoming human is a kind of vast joke whereby the creator of the ends of the earth comes among us in diapers. (laughs) Until we, too, have taken the idea of the God-man seriously enough to be scandalized by it, we have not taken it as seriously as it demands to be taken. (laughs) We need to be scandalized. We need to be shocked. We need to be oohed and awed and marvel at this reality of the God-man, the hypostatic union, 100% God, 100% human, in the person of Jesus. And you might be asking, like, why does this matter? Outside of just, like, feeling smarter because you use, like, a a phrase like hypostatic union, why does this matter? And we said last week it matters so much for how we live our lives and how we interact with God and how we interact with other people. We put it this way. This was our big idea last week. That in Jesus' divinity, he shows us what God is like. And we can't miss this. That Jesus has always been like, or God has always been like Jesus. And that Jesus is what God has to say. Paul tells us in the book of Colossians, uh, he says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus. Because in Jesus' divinity, he shows us what God is like. And that's really important for us. But also, in Jesus' humanity, he shows us what it means to be truly human. (laughs) Because Jesus was 100% human, and he is our prototype. He is uh, sort of uh, our model for the way that we're called to walk through this life and be human. (laughs) He's our model for us getting this life right. And I don't know about you, I can only speak for me, but I need help on being a better human. I want to just, I don't want to just like struggle to get through life. I want to thrive in this thing called life. And Jesus teaches us that. And because he was 100% human, he can encourage us, challenge us, and invite us to be like him. If he was just God, it'd be like Superman saying, hey, I want you to fly like me, but I'm not from Krypton. You know, and we just fall off of a building, right? It doesn't make sense, but because he's 100% human, we can follow him. We can be like him. And Jesus is teaching us how to be truly human. I've, I've been around church uh, my whole life, and I think often I've heard people say, oh, well, like, you know, I'm just not quite an angel yet, and when I get to heaven, I'll get to be an angel. And that's not actually how it works. And, and the reality is that uh, our, the goal and the, the journey of the Christian life is not for us to become angels. Jesus is inviting us, and Jesus created you and created me to become truly human, gloriously human. And Jesus shows us how we can do that. And so last week we talked about that big idea that Jesus is God and Jesus is human. Today we're going to talk about one way that we can be like Jesus in his humanity. And it's maybe in a surprising way, but we're going to talk about how we can grow to be like Jesus and how we can grow like Jesus grew. 
And when I was thinking about this um, and preparing this message, I was thinking about overnight success stories. Isn't there something in our culture that we're kind of obsessed with these overnight success stories where you don't know somebody's name and then like the next week they've like popped the cultural consciousness and they're everywhere. We can't like escape them. I think it's interesting. We're always like fascinated by these stories like where they came out of nowhere and now they're so popular. But what's interesting to me about overnight success stories is that they're really never just overnight. (laughs) There's always a long journey of growth, grit, determination for somebody to get there. Just to give us a couple examples in the pop culture realm, this is uh, Luka Doncic, who's the starting point guard for the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, He is only 21 years old. He came into the league as a rookie three years ago, and he just, uh, everybody was mad when Atlanta drafted him, but then they traded the pick to Dallas, and Dallas was so mad that they have this uh, white Serbian kid as their rookie, and they're like so upset about it, but he came into the league, and he was like almost immediately uh, averaging a triple-double. Today, he's like in his third season, the top five scoring in the league. He basically averages a triple-double. He's a walking bucket, you guys. He's amazing. And people thought, well, this kid just came out of nowhere. But the reality is that Luca, when he was seven months old, he became obsessed with a basketball and he wanted to have one in his hands all the time. He started to try to learn how to dribble and shoot up at these little toy goals even before he was one year old. When he was eight, he was playing against middle schoolers in a middle school league when he was eight years old. And when he was 13, he got drafted by Real Madrid, which is a professional team in Spain to play professional basketball in Europe. And then he became an all-star and he's in the Hall of Fame of the Euro League before he was even drafted at age 18 to the NBA and he became rookie of the year, his rookie season. It was a long journey. It was a lot of practice, a lot of grit and determination for him to become as good as he is. And man, I wish he was on the Pacers, if I can just say that. (laughs) Next, uh, you you might not recognize this next person. This is Lady Gaga, and you might not recognize her because she's wearing clothes and not a meat dress. Um, (laughs) But Lady Gaga, if you can remember back to 2008, she became like an, what seemed to be an overnight sensation. You could not turn your head. You couldn't look to the left and right without hearing poker face, poker face, right? And the reality is that she, it was not an overnight success story. There was a lot of work. When she was four years old, her parents made her take piano lessons three times a week so she could become a cultured young woman. And then when she was uh, 13, her parents would drive her into New York City to play open mic nights at bars and clubs when nobody was really paying attention to listening, but she would learn how to perform in front of an audience. And then every summer when she was a middle schooler and high schooler, she'd go to these creative art camps where she'd spend all summer learning how to craft melodies and lyrics and how to write songs. I mean, her album in 2008, The Fame, was big, you guys, but it wasn't just like it just happened one day. There were years and years of grit, determination, practice, performing, getting it over and over and over again before she could say, just dance. Da, 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 da. I gotta move on. Here is another picture. This is uh, somebody that you might have forgotten about, but all the way back in 10 years ago in January of 2021 at the inauguration, uh, this was Amanda Gorman, and she shared this incredible poem at the inauguration about the possibilities of our country, and it was so moving, and she was the most Googled name for like a week, and then we moved on pretty quickly, but uh, she just wrote so powerfully and performed, and it was such a powerful order. People were like, this overnight sensation, Amanda Gorman, like where did she come from? Actually, her story was a long journey when you think about it. Uh, She was born into extreme poverty, to a single mom. There were multiple kids living in uh, urban Los Angeles. Uh, She actually overcame, this is amazing to me, she overcame a severe speech impediment that she struggled with all the way through high school um, to where she couldn't make certain sounds without a speech impediment, but she overcame that and went to um, went to therapy to make that happen. And then she got a, a scholarship to Harvard and went to Harvard and graduated with 3.98 GPA and blew everybody away, right? And then she, she trained and she learned how to write and to be a poet. That's why she took our country by storm back in January, right? There was a long process that went on. These people each and every one of them, and every overnight success story you've ever heard, they worked hard, they learned, they practiced, they grew slowly and steadily to where then they became successful. <laughs> overnight success stories aren't really overnight at all. I love what Malcolm Gladwell, who's this great author, a great storyteller, uh, wrote in his book from 2006 called Outliers. Uh, this is what he said about this uh, idea of mastering things. He says, it takes 10,000 hours to truly master anything. 
Time spent leads to experience. Experience leads to proficiency. And the more proficient you are, the more valuable you'll be. Now, that last sentence, I'll take a little issue with his theology. But, like, the main point of what he's saying there is it takes 10,000 hours to truly master anything. It takes a lot of hard work, grit, determination for us to grow, to be great at anything. And when we think about Jesus, this is where it gets interesting to me and maybe a little scandalous to each and every one of us because Jesus grew. Now, we don't know a ton about Jesus' life, actually. There's been a lot of fan fiction written about Jesus and how he grew up. But we know a lot about his birth at Christmas, and then we have basically a blank canvas until he turned 30 and he came onto the scene and started performing miracles and teaching and telling people about the kingdom of God. So we have like 30 years there where we don't really know very much that happened. I mean, think about this. Jesus lived approximately 33 years, which is 12,000 days. He probably slept for 4,000 of those days, not like a day at a time, but, you know, like normal sleep at a over time. It made 4,000 days. So the question is, uh, what did he even do with those other 8,000 days? And the gospels, these four biographies that we have, these ancient biographies we have in our New Testament, they only help us out um, with about 100 of those days. There's about enough material there for 100 days, but Jesus lived for 12,000 days. So what actually happened in Jesus' life? And we don't know too much. There is one account that we have in the gospel of Luke about boy Jesus. It's like boy wonder, right? But we get like one picture of Jesus as a 12-year-old stinky boy. (laughs) I'm just adding the stinky part, but I just assume that because he was fully human, he had to be a stinky 12-year-old, right? (laughs) But we get one narrative, one story of Jesus' life when he was 12. And I think inside of this story, uh, man, there's some things that we'll marvel at. There are some things that are going to challenge us, and there are some things that will help us to become the true human beings that Jesus wants us to be, (laughs) that God created us to be, if we dive into this text together. So in Luke chapter 2, right after the Christmas account that we get, this is where we're going to spend most of our time this morning, starting in verse 43. Pick up here. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. Now, a couple of things we need to understand here, that Jesus, being a a, a Jewish uh, boy, uh, he he was a Jewish person, and so uh, they actually would travel, that God commanded the Jewish people to travel from wherever they lived to the capital city, Jerusalem, three times a year for a party. The Passover festival was a big party. Now, just a little bit of a sidebar here. When we think about the temperament of God, uh, do we normally think about God being the one who's demanding that we party and celebrate? No, we're thinking about God as the one saying, don't party, don't celebrate, but that's a whole other message for another time. But they're commanded to celebrate the Passover with this big feast and dancing and celebration. And so they travel there to celebrate the Passover, which is where God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. And it was this amazing thing that God did for their ancestors. They're celebrating it. And so they would travel to Jerusalem to do so. And this was a three-day journey. And what we know from antiquity is that it wouldn't be just like one family traveling. They'd make this huge, huge caravan of lots of different families, basically neighborhoods and whole tribes that would travel together to come to Jerusalem because it was a three-day journey. And they just traveled together because there was safety inside of numbers. Luke tells us this next in the text. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. My friends, this is Jesus' home alone moment. Like, Kevin, where's Kevin? But I'm not going to say Jesus' name because that would sound sacrilegious if I did it in that moment. But, like, this is the moment, right, the home alone moment, because, it, because all of a sudden they're looking for Jesus, and he's not there, and they've already traveled multiple days away. Now, ask the parents in the room, have you ever lost your kids, maybe just for a couple moments, a couple minutes? <laughs> like, two weeks ago, uh, we, we lost our two-year-old here at the church for about 30 seconds, and it was terrifying. Um, But you've probably been there before. You feel that fear, that panic, that anxiety that comes over you. And before we start, like, just throwing Jesus, mom and dad, Mary and Joseph under the bus for losing their kid, right, this shows us how, like, tight-knit of a community it was in the ancient Jewish world because families and extended families and friends would all travel together, and they're probably assuming they're hanging out with Uncle Joey or they're hanging out over here. They're, like, doing this thing together. But they lose Jesus, and they travel back into Jerusalem to find him. And what we're told next is truly shocking to me as well. 
After three days, we don't get like the text about what was going on in Mary's anxiety levels during those three days, but I can imagine they're through the roof. Uh, but after three days, they, find, they found Jesus in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, the religious teachers in the temple. And Jesus was listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now, this is amazing about Jesus' humanity to me. Like, we see Jesus, who is the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who's going to rescue the whole world. And what's Jesus' posture towards these religious teachers and leaders? He's listening to them. He's not shouting them down. (laughs) Uh, He's listening to them. He's asking them questions. This is actually very just like cultural to this part of a Jewish boy's life. They would enter into this part of their Jewish education to where they're supposed to ask questions of the rabbis. I love this about the Jewish educational system. I think we can learn a little bit about it in our country, not to sidebar too far. But um, in the Jewish educational system, you're supposed to learn to discover The goal is to discover the truth. The goal is to wrestle with things and come to your own conclusions instead of being told what the answer is. You're supposed to discover, and that's the goal of education, which I find to be beautiful. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's asking questions. He's listening to his teachers, and they're just amazed at his understanding, his insights, and the way that he can connect to the text in a powerful way, especially for a 12-year-old boy. And we're told this next. When his parents saw him in the temple courts, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And like, can you just imagine like that moment? Whenever you like find your kids and like you think your kids are gonna be hurt and then you realize they're not hurt, you're still yelling at them a little bit because you've just been so upset. And you sort of feel this from Mary and Joseph as they're talking to Jesus. And Jesus responds oddly. He he says, why were you searching for me, he asked, which I think is just a little messianic snark going on there. I think he had a little bit of a wry smile going on. He's like, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? House, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Now, Jesus does something really interesting here. Uh, he says, oh, didn't you know I was in my father's house, re- referring to the temple? Now, what would have been interesting is the confusion that Mary and Joseph would have felt because Jewish people in the first century, they didn't refer to God as my father. They referred to God as our father collectively. So for Jesus to say my father, he was showing a different level of intimacy to where they must have thought he was talking about Joseph, his earthly father, but Jesus wasn't talking about that. That's why they were so confused. So we continue on. Luke tells us this. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them, but his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Now, this is fascinating to me that Luke would include this and that Jesus would do this, but after Jesus like, gave them this lecture about him being like in his father's house, he went back home with them and was obedient to them. Jesus listened to his mom and dad. Maybe you've got teenagers. Maybe you should just use this line on them, guys. Like, well, Jesus listened to his mom and dad. Actually, don't do that. That will never work. (laughs) Terrible parenting advice here. But Jesus actually humbled himself and listened to his earthly mom and dad and was obedient to them. And then I love what Luke does to sort of cap this narrative, to give purpose and understanding um, to this narrative of Jesus uh, being uh, this boy. I love what Luke says. He says this to cap this section out. He says, and then Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Luke tells us that the, the savior and the master of the universe, Jesus, he humbled himself and he grew. He grew in wisdom. He grew in his stature, just being a human being. He grew in favor with God and in favor with man. Jesus grew. Right? Now, that word grew in the original language, it gives us this word picture of like pressing forward, beating forward. It's like the idea of taking a machete through the bush and just cutting your way through. It's not an easy kind of natural growth. There's a different word for that in the Greek language. And this is actually like pushing forth persistent grit, fighting forward is the language that we're given. And we're told that Jesus did this. I think often in Christian circles and church circles, uh, there's this sort of unspoken tension between understanding God's grace and understanding this call for people to grow in knowledge of God and to grow in their faith. There's this tension where sometimes people are like, well, you shouldn't try to grow because then you're trying to earn things. And we gotta understand it's all about grace. And that's an interesting tension for us to hold. But I love what theologian and author uh, Dallas Willard says about this. This is helpful for me to understand. He says this, grace is not opposed to effort but it is opposed to earning. 
Isn't that powerful? That, that grace and understanding our life with God, it, it's not opposed to us like putting forth effort and trying to grow, but it is opposed to this attitude that we can earn anything. And I think this is what Jesus is showing us, that Jesus is putting forth effort, but he's not trying to earn anything from his heavenly father. And that's the same invitation that you and I have to become truly human is for us to put forth effort, understanding we can never earn it, but we put forth effort to grow, to evolve, to develop, to beat our path forward to who God has called us to be. So what I want to do is I want to look at the ways that Luke tells us that Jesus grew and beat his path forward. And I think inside of each one of these, there's a challenge for us. If we're going to look at Jesus not only as our savior, but as our model, as our prototype for how to be truly human. These are ways that he's inviting us to grow as well. The first way that Jesus grew is that Jesus grew in wisdom. So we're challenged to grow in wisdom like Jesus. We're challenged to grow in wisdom like him. Uh, you know, something I find fascinating about Jesus, maybe you've never thought of before, is that Jesus didn't come like pre-programmed with all of this knowledge. Jesus humbled himself to learn. <laughs> he didn't come like pre-programmed, like you think like in like the Matrix, if you guys can remember those movies, like they would like push a button, they would download kung fu and jujitsu into them and then they could just fight. Uh, Jesus didn't have that. Jesus had to learn the old-fashioned way. He had to learn, ask questions, to grow so that he could even understand the Bible. He sat under teachers and he asked questions about the text and he wrestled with the scripture so that he could discover the true meanings. Jesus humbled himself to have to grow in wisdom and have to grow in understanding. And one of my favorite things about Jesus is that Jesus was curious Think about that. Jesus was curious. His wheels were always turning, trying to understand people and trying to understand God and how the world that his heavenly father had made. So much so that throughout the gospels, all four of these ancient biographies, Jesus asked over 300 questions, you guys. Like it was like he was jeoparding everybody all the time, asking more questions than they could possibly imagine. And sometimes they were mundane questions and sometimes they were deep questions. He would ask questions like, do you want to get well? He'd ask questions like, why are you sleeping? <laughs> He'd ask questions like, who touched me? He'd ask questions, and this is a very important deep question, where can we buy food? <laughs> Jesus asked that kind of a question. Jesus was curious. He wanted to grow in wisdom and understand. He wasn't satisfied with the way his brain was wired by itself. He wanted to grow and understand more. I think this is such a great challenge to us. Uh, somebody who's uh, very popular in um, modern culture, um, he, he's a teacher. He's actually an atheist. I don't see the world the same way he does, but I can humble myself to learn from him. His name's Sam Harris. He, he says this, which is such a great challenge to me. Maybe it is to you as well. He says, we must pay attention to the frontiers of our ignorance. We must pay attention to the frontiers, the front lines of our ignorance, the things that we don't understand. In other words, the most dangerous thing to actually growing in knowledge and wisdom is feeling like you know everything. Isn't that true? That there are things that we don't understand, and it's really important for us to understand that we don't understand those things. Can I say that again? There are things that we don't understand, and it's really important for us to understand that we don't understand those things. How many understands can I fit in that sentence, right? But we must pay attention to the frontiers of our ignorance. We need to understand what we don't know and then humble ourselves and have the passion and the grit and the determina determination to know more about those things. That's the kind of life that Jesus lived as he was hungry for wisdom. You know, to be a follower, to be a disciple in the ancient world, literally meant to be a learner or to be an apprentice. And that is what Jesus is inviting us to be, to be learners, to be apprentices, learning the way that we are to walk through this life. But I'll tell you what it takes that often we don't have just to be really honest with you, it takes humility and it takes passion. It takes humility saying, I don't understand everything. <laughs> and it takes passion. It takes determination to go and ask the question, to seek out an answer. It takes humility and passion and hunger to learn more. And that's what Jesus had. And that's what he's inviting us to have as well. My, my friends, there has never been a time where we've had more information at our fingertips for us to learn more, to discover the things we don't understand, to master those things. From podcasts to the Bible app that could be on our phone in every translation we could ever imagine, to audible.com and audible audiobooks, to where if you don't like turning pages and reading, you have somebody read to you. That's pretty amazing. And if you want to get like real old school and like, like have paper in front of you, you could even get a book. I know. Wild 
crazy stuff. But there are all these things that we have at our fingertips like never before. Not only that, but we can seek out people that like might know more than we do and humble ourselves to learn from them and have conversations with them to ask questions of them. I have a couple of relationships with some people that are much smarter than I am, people that I would consider my teachers that I can email questions to. I can ask them, how would you take this issue? How would you like understand this passage? And they'll send me emails and respond back. I'm actually having uh, like a half a day with one of these guys in uh, Cincinnati in a couple weeks. And I just want to humble myself to learn from them so that I can understand more, so I can grow in wisdom, not just for my head knowledge, for my head to feel better, bigger, but so that I can be more like Jesus, who was always growing in wisdom. Do we have that humility? Have we taken our foot off the gas of wanting to discover more, and we just feel comfortable knowing what we know, and we'll just hit, yes, next episode on Netflix? And Jesus grew in wisdom. He's inviting us all to do the same. The next thing that Luke tells us that Jesus, how, how he grew, is that he grew in favor with God. So we're challenged to grow in favor with God. Now, we got to be careful with the language here that Luke employs because uh, it's not the way we understand it today. Today, when we think of growing in favor, it means that we get on somebody's good side, right? Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get in with so-and-so, and then I'm going to have their favor. They're going to owe me something. That's not the way this language is employed in the ancient world. To grow in favor with somebody in the ancient world was to be in relationship with, to be in rhythm, to be in harmony with somebody or something. And so when Luke says that Jesus grew in favor with God, he's saying that Jesus lived a life that was in fluid harmony and with rhythm with his heavenly father. He grew more and more. He cultivated a relationship with his heavenly father. He cultivated that relationship. He showed us what living a life that's in full rhythm with God looks like. And there are so many different scriptures and different little breadcrumbs that the gospels give us of the way that Jesus did this because Jesus got away and he spent time with his heavenly father. He made space for God in his life. Just to look at a few of these examples of him cultivating this relationship and growing in favor with God. Uh, he's looking at the gospel of Mark. Uh, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. The gospel of Luke, uh, chapter six, one of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. We can't quite get the location right in Howard County, right? Uh, but he spent the night praying to God. Matthew 14, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. We see over and over and over again throughout Jesus' life, the Gospels tell us that he cultivated a relationship with his Heavenly Father by getting alone with him. He did this for many different reasons. Sometimes it was to prepare for a major task he had in front of him. Sometimes it was before he had to make a major decision. Sometimes it was to recharge his batteries from the hard work. Like, think about that alone, the humanity of Jesus, that he needed to recharge before he could go do another thing. Also, Jesus would get off and pray with his heavenly father in solitude um, to work through grief to work through distress, to work through his own anxiety. I mean, how beautiful is that in the humanity of Jesus? This was part of his pattern of um, self-care in this way. But Jesus did this so that he could cultivate a relationship with his heavenly father and so that he could be centered on who he truly was. My friends, we have to be people that cultivate a relationship with God, that make space for God in our lives so that we can be truly human. And every time, I I promise you this, um, every time you will make space for God in your life, whether that's early in the morning, late at night, in the middle of the day with an alarm blowing up on your phone, every time you make space for God, he will fill it. It is a promise. He will make, if we make space, he will fill it. And can I just be real, like my struggle in this, that I am not naturally prone to make space for God in the heavy moments of my life, the challenging moments of my life. Honestly, when I reflect on it, often um, in my humanity, when I've got a stressful thing going on, a big decision I've got to make, a lot of work in front of me, uh, I don't naturally walk towards God. I naturally take two or three steps to the other direction. I walk a little farther away from God than I want. That's just me and my humanity. Um, So I just want to let you know that it's not natural for me. But in those seasons of my life where I can center myself on truth, I can center myself on, hey, God, it's just me and you talking. I just want to spend time in your presence. Uh, Man, it changes everything for me. And it, it makes me feel like this is how I was created to live. If I can, like, have this moment before I go into that meeting or before I talk to this banker, before I do all this stuff, 
man, it just centers me and it changes me in those moments if I make space for God. And that's what Jesus did. That's how he grew in favor with God. He grew in favor with God. He was in rhythm with God because he'd make space to be with him alone. Lastly, Luke tells us this, that Jesus grew in favor with man. So we're challenged to grow in favor with man, to be in rhythm, to be in harmony with people in our horizontal relationships. Have you ever thought about this, that uh, Jesus deliberately and intentionally chose to do his life on earth with people? Like, Jesus could have lone rangered this thing. He could have, like, you know, come to earth and, like, been like, no, mom and dad, uh, I can feed myself now. I'm going to go do my ministry thing. I don't need any friends. I'm just going to walk through life and do my own thing. He could have done that. God could have chosen to write the story of Jesus that way. But Jesus deliberately chose not to. It's almost like this, and hear me carefully on this, that Jesus chose to limit himself to need other people. Let me say this again. This is so important, and maybe it's a scandalous idea, but Jesus chose to limit himself to need other people in his life. Not because he had to, but he chose to limit himself because I think he wanted to show us what it really looks like to be human because you and I, we need each other. We need other people to thrive in this life. And Jesus was showing us that being truly human is needing a community, needing people around you that are running in the same direction that you are, that can lift you up when you fall and sometimes help you not fall in the first place. You need that. And hear me on this, men specifically, you need other people in your life. You need running partners. You need mates in your life. And that's not an indictment on your strength. And that is just a reality check of the human experience and the way that Jesus created you to live. You need people. Jesus chose to limit himself to need other people because we cannot go through this life on our own. So Jesus, he traveled with friends. He went to parties with friends. He went to weddings and shut down weddings with friends. He invited people to join his circle all the time. He had a circle of tight-knit friends, but there was always a gap in the circle to invite others to be, hey, come follow me. Come be part of my crew, of my family. Jesus was always doing life with people. And one other side note with Jesus and people, you ever thought about like Jesus, he was winsome to people. Like, People that were nothing like Jesus, which is like everybody, um, people that were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus, and he liked spending time with them. People were drawn to Jesus that were struggling, that were on the outside of society, outside of the religious circles. People were drawn to Jesus like a bug to a light. (laughs) Let me just ask you the question. Maybe it's a challenging question. Are people drawn to you? Are people drawn to us as Jesus followers? Or are we repelling people? Are people drawn to us? Do they want to spend time with us? Do they feel better about their lives when they spend time with us? Do they feel like they belong when they're with us? Or are they pushed away and repelled by us? One of the challenges of the humanity of Jesus is to be a winsome person. That people like you. (laughs) And they like spending time with you. Because that's who Jesus was. It's one of the ways that Jesus grew in favor with man. And that's one of the challenges for us as well. So Jesus grew in wisdom. He grew in favor with God and rhythm with God, his father. And he grew in favor and rhythm and harmony with other people. This is who he was. I'm going to leave us with two uh, quick challenges and implications. I just don't want, don't want us to leave without hearing these things. The first is this. For you, this is true, my friends, that you have the grace to grow. God gives you grace to grow. What happens a lot in these conversations and these kind of sermons is you leave feeling guilty about where you're not or like, oh, I haven't read my Bible. I don't make space to pray. Oh, I'm just not doing what I ought to do. I should do. And then you feel guilty. Then you feel shameful. Then you hide. And then it's just the rinse and repeat shame cycle, right? (laughs) And I want you to hear that one of the powerful things about the humanity of Jesus is that Jesus was in process at one point. Jesus was growing. He was changing. He was developing. He had things to learn. And he understands the struggle of spiritual growth. He understands the struggle of growing up and growing to be the human being that you were created to be. He sees you in your struggle. He gives you grace in your struggle. And he loves you exactly the way that you are. Hear me on this, you guys. There is nothing you can do, no spiritual religious activity that you could ever accomplish or put into your life to make you make God love you more than he loves you right now. 
You can't make him love you more than he loves you right now. His disposition, his countenance towards you is love. And he gives you grace for who you've not become yet. So do not leave feeling shame or guilt about what you don't understand yet, the things in your life that are broken and are not working the way you want and what you ought to be because Jesus sees you and he understands you and he gives you grace to grow. But there's also this clear reality as well, that you have the challenge to grow. That Jesus, he desires for you to grow. Jesus loves you exactly the way that you are right now, but he loves you way too much to just want you, to desire for you just to stay exactly the way that you are. He invites you to grow, to evolve, to change, to develop the way that his son Jesus grew and developed. And this is important because some of, some of us this morning, we're stagnant. We're a little bored. I mean, it was hard for us to get to church this morning, not just because of the weather outside, but because we're like, oh, I've sort of seen it all, felt it all, done the things, and it didn't really change my life. And so you're sort of checking out. Maybe not like ultimately checked out yet because that'll bring some social awkwardness, but you're mentally and emotionally checked out. And I know that that story's in the room this morning. I'm so glad you're here. But I, here's the reality I want you to know is that God's got more for you. God's got more for you. And the on-ramp to that more is not by just simply doing more, having more checklists uh, for you to check off on your spiritual life, but it's, man, it's to follow Jesus, to look at the full Jesus, divine and human, and be like, okay, Jesus, you, if you're the prototype for me to thrive in this life, how can I follow you? That's the more that God has for you. you take everything else away, but man, I want to follow Jesus. I want to know him in his divinity 100%. I want to know him in his humanity 100%. I want to follow him. So here's the challenge for you, for us to grow. It's to grow in wisdom, for us to learn more, to discover more, to be curious about God and the way that God and the scriptures, they, they, they line up and they make sense in this complicated modern time we live in. Don't quit searching have the conversation, ask the question, be curious the way that Jesus is curious. Grow in favor with God. <laughs> Find a new rhythm, try a new pattern to where you can get alone with God. Have maybe just five minutes to start, but you wanna hear from him. You wanna align yourself and center yourself on what's ultimately true, not what you're feeling or not what the world's throwing at you. You grow in wisdom and you grow in favor with God and grow in favor with man. Don't do life on your own because Jesus chose to limit himself to need people and my friends, we need each other on this journey as well. And my friends, you can grow like Jesus. That's the invitation, is that we don't have to be the same. And we have grace to grow, and we have this challenge to grow in wisdom and grow in favor with God and with man.